Well, the title says it all. A single image landscape end-to-end workflow. Here we go. Hi, and welcome to episode 34 of Understanding Darktable. Got a whole bunch of viewer Q&A to cover at the end of this video. But right now, an end-to-end processing of a single landscape image as requested. So I've got this image taken about three years ago on a winter's morning on a beach in New South Wales. It's the wreck of an old ferry. And I had seen this the previous afternoon. I knew that it was facing east, so I figured it was a good candidate for a sunrise shoot. And so I came out early the following morning to shoot it. Now, the version you're looking at is obviously one that I've already done some processing on, uh, but I've created a duplicate of it and I've set the history stack right back to original. So I've undone all of the default things that Darktable did to the image when I imported it. And we're going to work through just, again, my personal workflow. Uh, I want to stress that there's no right and wrong with this stuff. It's just my take. Now, as previously mentioned with Darktable, there is what's called the pixel pipe. And that is the order in which all modules are processed. And just to remind you, if you've forgotten, it does not matter what order you activate or deactivate a module, that will not change the order in which the modules are actually processed. And that will become relevant when we get to the viewer Q&A at the end. For now, we're looking at my favorites the modules that I've starred as my favorite modules. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to work through this image and I'm just going to stick to these modules. These are the modules that I tend to use 90% of the, actually probably 95% of the time. And I know that there are other modules and in the rare cases when I want one of those modules, I'll go and find it in one of the other five groups. But like I said, for 95% of what I do, the stuff that I have favorited is the stuff that I need. And it covers most of the bases. So let's work our way through this. As someone commented after the last video where I processed all of the uh, images from the Mardi Gras, they said, oh, you know, I, I crop first as well. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention that I personally believe that cropping should be done early simply because sometimes you'll take a shot, you know, and it might be a bit of a spur of the moment type shot where you end up with something in the frame that, you know, maybe is a highlight that really wasn't part of the story. You know, it might have been an open window that light was pouring through or, you know, it might have been a light bulb hanging from the ceiling or whatever. And quite often when you crop out that unnecessary content, the stuff that you know is not going to be in the final image early in the process, that will change the way the histogram looks as you're working on other modules whilst you're developing that image. So that's just my mental thought process regarding cropping and why I do my cropping early because things that are super dark or things that are super bright that I know aren't going to end up in the shot if I crop them out early then that will you know update the way the histogram displays for the rest of the development process so with that in mind let's go straight to the crop and rotate tool uh, as you can see, I've already selected a 16 by 9 aspect ratio because that's probably what I want for this because I'm likely to use this as desktop wallpaper on my computer or on my phone or something like that. And what I'm immediately noticing is this pole over here on the right hand side of the frame. To me, that's not really part of this story. So I want to get rid of that. So we'll get rid of that. And although this beach is curved, I actually think I've got the horizon quite level when I set the tripod up for this shot. So I don't feel the need to rotate, but I would like to get that transition line between the land and the ocean in the foreground 
to sit on this upper third. So I'm going to drag that down and I can't go far enough because I've run out of sand. So I'm just going to crop a little bit further down to there. And I'm actually liking that. I might go just a smidge further. No, no, I won't. I, I, I'm going to set it about there. And what I do like about this is that the wreck of the ferry is sitting pretty close to the intersection of the right vertical third and the upper horizontal third. And if you know your rule of thirds, you know, parts of the image which sit at these intersections tend to give the image a bit more weight and a bit more gravitas. So I'm happy with where that ferry is sitting in the overall composition of this frame. So I'm going to keep it like that. Yep, I like that. Okay, let's come back to the white balance. Now, I shot this with a daylight white balance in camera because it was early morning. The sun had just come up over the horizon and I specifically got out there early so that that would be the case. Let's just see if I was to try the spot white balance to see what Darktable's interpretation of the white balance is. And it really hasn't changed it that much. If I went for the daylight, it's warmed it up just a touch. You know what? They're so close to what I got out of the camera that I'll probably just leave it on the camera white balance and move on. In terms of exposure, we can see on the histogram that I have not pushed this exposure to the right when I shot it and part of that was that this is actually the cherry picked image out of a whole sequence of shots. Some I exposed even darker, some I exposed brighter and to my mind this was the best exposure of the whole lot. And what I've found in previous attempts at processing this image is that if I do try and push that histogram further to the right I lose all these nice golden tones in the sky on the left hand side. Just to demonstrate, if I was to go up a third of a stop, that's not too bad. If I was to go up two thirds of a stop, yeah, I, I feel like I'm losing those nice golden tones. So I'm actually not going to bother with the exposure module at all. Retouch. I think I will because there was, up here in the sky, this little bit of dirt on the sensor. So I'm not going to bother introducing wavelet scales. I'm just going to work on the base image just to get rid of that. And I did have a scout around earlier on and I couldn't see any other dirt in there. I think that was the only spot, so that's not too bad. Oh. There is this, this little piece of, I don't know if it's metal or wood, I think it's metal, and just the top edge of it is copping this little bit of sunlight. And it's not awful, but I can't help but notice it now that I'm aware of it. So I'm actually going to use the retouch module again, and I'm just going to draw a little path around this and I'll use the same metal texture as the source like so and yes it does create a bit of repetition and yes we can see it because we saw it get done and so the magic trick has been exposed but when you zoom out no one's going to pick that like to, to someone who hasn't seen this video and who just sees the final image, they're not going to pick up on the fact that that was done. But to me, it just removes, if I just undo that, see the moment I undo that, that little bit of sunlight becomes really irritating. <laughs> I see it the minute it's there. So I like the fact that it's gone. Okay, moving on. I think I would probably go to filmic next and i have to confess that this is one time sorry aurelian where filmic has let me down uh, i don't know why the moment i introduce it i just lose all of that gold in the sky 
even without having done anything else in the filmic module. And the only way I'd get that back would be... See, even moving this darker, it takes ages before those golden tones come back. Like, if I undo that... Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm not going with filmic on this particular occasion. I'm thinking I'd be more inclined to go with the tone curve. So... I don't need to brighten the light parts at all. I do want to bring the bottom part of this, I don't know what you call this line, but the tone curve, I guess, over to the right to the point where this histogram falls off. Right, so I want to bring that black point in a bit. I want to darken it down just a touch, but then open up some of those mid-tones. There we go. It's brought out some nice, rich, golden mahogany colours in both the sand of this embankment and the wood of this ferry. But it's still given me some dark tones here in the sand. I feel like I'm losing that gold a little bit, but we can work on that later. So far, so good. Okay, next. I could probably go to the color zones. Actually, let's just jump up to sharpen because that's one of the things that Darktable normally does when I import my RAW files. It normally applies a sharpen module uh, as a default. So let's zoom into 100% and we'll have a look. So by default, the Sharpen module goes for a radius of 2 pixels and a strength of 0.5. Let's just turn that on. And that is barely noticeable. And I'm just going to bump this up to... Well, let's just go to 1. And let's widen that to 2.5 pixels. And then let's just compare before and after. That's not bad. I might actually push the amount a little bit harder. I did some testing before I recorded this video and I found that around about 1.2 sort of worked for me. I felt like anything beyond that, it started to look a little bit overdone. So before, after, yeah. I, I'm thinking about 1.2 was my sweet spot for me personally. Okay, that's nice. Uh, Velvia, if you never had the pleasure of shooting Velvia slide film, I weep for you. Velvia was gorgeous. It was a slide film made by Fujifilm, and it just had the most beautiful colors. And of course, slide film being positive, unlike negative, you know, C41, the colors got richer and more saturated as you underexposed, whereas with C41 neg film, colors tended to get a little bit richer as you slightly overexposed. Um, Velvia was beautiful. I used to love shooting Velvia. So let's just introduce a little bit of that. Oh, that's looking good. Oh, that's looking good. Oh, oh, how far can we push that? Yeah, I feel like we're going too far. I'm thinking somewhere around about 55% is probably nice. That's brought some of that nice gold back into the sky. It's made these mahogany tones even richer again. I'm liking that. Liking that a lot. Uh, in terms of other things, a graduated density. Yeah, I wouldn't mind darkening some of this sand in the foreground. So I'm going to go, let's say, two stops. And we need that going the other way to darken the foreground. That's probably a little too much. I might just go one and a half stops. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. I'm not going to introduce any color into the graduated density. I think the colors are just nice on the sand as they are. But that little darkening just helps to draw your eye up into the body of the image away from the foreground. Without it, I feel like the there's just a little... It feels like too much of a big open space at the bottom of the frame where nothing's really happening and there's nothing to draw your eye. But by 
introducing that graduated density, it just, you know, it, it draws your eye up into the centre of the frame. You know, the, the general theory is that the eye is drawn to whatever is the brightest thing in the frame. So what we want is, you know, light where our subject is, as a general rule. Obviously, rules can be broken, rules can be bent, but uh, yeah, I feel like that has just helped to draw the eye up to the ferry. So I'm liking that. What else would I do here? Let's try color zones. I've only just added color zones to my favorites because now that I'm using that for my black and white processing, I'm finding I'm also using it for a little bit of color work as well. So let's see. Let's give those blues a little bit more saturation in the sky. Just a smidge. Actually, maybe I'll darken them as well. Just to give that sky a bit more punch. Oh, that's looking good. And that helps to contrast against that golden glow of the rising sun. I really like that. That's nice. Uh, in terms of other saturation... I wouldn't mind just finding... Okay, so we're down here in the yellows and the oranges. I don't think the saturation needs anything, but I might just lighten it up a smidge. So let's just... Oh, yeah. There we go. There we go. Oh, 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 oh. But I don't want to lose the yellows in the sky. Okay, let's, let's just bring it over this way a little bit. There we go. That's brought the yellow back into the sky a touch. Nice, nice. Let's just uh, darken our reds a little bit. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Undo that, redo. Oh, nice. Oh, I like it, I like it. Okay, what else? I don't think we need any more saturation in this image. You depending on your aesthetic you might want to increase saturation a little bit but i actually think oh ooh, i could be swayed i could be swayed oh i don't i don't want to go too far with that yeah yeah i think that's about as much as i'd want to go i think any more and it's going to look overcooked that's before that's after yeah that's nice i like that okay is there anything else I would do here? I really don't think so. I don't want filmic. I don't want monochrome. I don't want exposure. I'm certainly not going to split tone. I have split tone favorited because I quite often with my black and whites will introduce some split toning to that. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't do it to a color image and framing I'm not going to use at this point in time. So for me, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much done. Let's compare that with the previous development of this image that I had, which we looked at at the beginning, let's just go back. Wow, not even in the same ballpark. I now don't like that at all. I now look at this and go, yeah. Admittedly, the previous version, these reds look slightly more saturated than this. So maybe I could go back to color zones Go back to here and saturate the reds a little bit. Does that overdo it? It's, it's maybe bordering on being overdone. Let's just back the overall saturation off a little bit. Now let's compare those two. Yeah, that, that red really does pop in that particular version, but completely lost the blue in the sky, lost a lot of the gold in the sky as well. No, much preferring this, and I love the graduated density darkening the sand at the foreground as well. So that's it for me. For, for this particular image, that is my workflow, just my thoughts. Again, you know, the order in which the modules are processed under the hood is absolutely fixed and is not influenced by the order in which you activate modules within Darktable. Now, having said that, I want to get on to the viewer Q&A.
Now, one of the emails that I got in the last 24 hours from Alex from Germany, and one of the things he mentioned was that in the last episode where I did the end-to-end workflow of all the Mardi Gras images was I said at one point, now we've removed the rejected images from the database. And he said in his email, but you didn't actually show that. He said, I know how it's done. He said, but do all your viewers know how it's done? And I thought, that's strange because I remember covering that. And so I went back and watched the actual video that I rendered out of my video timeline and realized that I accidentally omitted that part. I thought it was an outtake and I cut it out. And so you didn't actually get to see me removing the images from the database that I didn't want to keep. However, having said that, I know I covered it in episode seven which was all about the selected images module. So Alex, maybe you haven't seen that video, but I'm pretty sure I covered it there. So hopefully everyone gets it. All right, comments that came in via YouTube. This was from Iramon. Hi Bruce, how about some comments on the order to use the developed modules? Well, I think I've just covered that. I've noticed some modules slow my computer down, so I save them for last. That's interesting. I. Obviously, I'm in the fortunate position where I've just upgraded all my computer hardware and the machine that I'm running now is pretty much cutting edge. Uh, And so I don't notice any modules making Darktable run slower. Um, Maybe if you're on older hardware, that is the case. And if that is the case, then I'm sorry, I, I don't know what to tell you. But like I said, the beauty of Darktable, well... Some people would call it the beauty of Darktable, some people would call it a failing, is that regardless of what order you activate a module, it doesn't change the order in which all of those processes take place under the hood. Now, where you do need to be careful with that, of course, is that if a module you activate late in your workflow actually happens early in the pixel pipe processing, you do need to be careful of whether that is going to negatively affect any other modules that you had activated, which in terms of the pixel pipe come after that particular module, if that makes sense. Um, So I can't give you exact examples, but do be aware that sometimes when you activate a module late in the workflow, it might adversely affect other modules that are already active. Okay. Are there other considerations concerning the order? Like you, I crop first. Thanks again for the great vids. Well, no, there are no other considerations that I'm aware of. If anyone has conflicting thoughts on that, please sing out in the uh, comments down below. Christian Rosencruz said, it'd be nice to see your workflow on a single image, say a portrait or a landscape. Which modules do you use for what ends and in which order, etc." Well, just done that, Christian, and I hope you found it useful. And I think there probably is value in doing a, another video somewhere down the track. I won't do it next, but maybe somewhere down the track. Another one like this, where it's a single image, and the whole process. And yes, I would do a studio portrait shot because that is a very different workflow to processing for a a landscape image. So I'll keep that as a, a potential future topic. I've yet to confirm this, but Yanya Ferris, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, said if you press Control Z at least three times, you can recover lost modules. That's interesting. I've not tried that, so I will have to check that one out. So thank you for the tip. Stefano Sandolo said, Hi Bruce, thanks for this video. I suppose the levels module works only on the luminosity histogram, while the clipping indicator shows the clipping of all RGB histogram channels. So that was in relation to when I was using the levels module, it was setting those black point and white points and creating, once you turn the clipping indicator on, what appeared to be clipping. So I think that's what Stefano was getting at there. So that's quite possibly the case, Stefano, and thanks for the heads up. 
Nikita said, Hi Bruce, this is my first YouTube subscription in 20 years. Thanks for the great job and competence. Well, thank you Nikita, I appreciate that. I'd like to hear your opinion about the lens correction module used on this video. That was the last video that I did. I've got the Sony a7 III like you, and I'd like to know what you think about the best setup for camera and dark table lens compensation. I set my camera with auto compensation on shading and chromatic aberration and no compensation, that is off, on distortion compensation. On dark table, I can enable all the corrections, distortion, vignetting, and total chromatic aberration on my lens, and I usually do it, also when the distortion is not clean cut. It's better to leave everything auto on the camera without software correction in Darktable or everything off and use all the corrections in Darktable or something else. I'm a bit confused. Do you enable the module only when the distortion is too evident? The manual says about corrections, change this from its default all if your camera has already done some internal corrections, e.g. vignetting, or if you plan to do a certain correction with a different program. But I don't know what auto means on Sony, and I don't know if Darktable can read the EXIF to understand what kind of corrections to enable or not. Thank you for your time. Sorry for my bad English. Mate, no worries. As I replied on the comments, my approach is, if you're going to shoot raw which for me is, you know, 99% of the time, I'm inclined to say, leave all of the correction until you get to dark table, because then you can do it non-destructively and you can undo it if you decide that you don't like what it did. If you are inclined to shoot JPEG in camera, then I would say, look at what the camera can do and perhaps activate some of that in camera. Uh, if you're shooting raw and JPEG, then I suppose you could activate it in camera because when you get the raw... Ooh, actually, no, that's an interesting point. Because that would theoretically influence the raw file as well in the camera. I will have to read up about that in the A7 III manual, which I'm still working my way through two and a half months down the track. <laughs> But thank you for the uh, email. Uh, there's certainly lots to think about there. Todd Pryor said, great video, Bruce. I noticed you had lots of export presets. I can imagine the use, obviously, about those created to create an image for the specs of an upload, say, for Facebook. Uh, could you comment on some of the others and the purposes they serve for you? Well, Todd, yeah, absolutely. Facebook, I set the JPEG compression at 95% because I know that Facebook is going to recompress the images. So I don't want them highly compressed before I upload because that just makes them turn to mush. And most of the other presets that I've got, if I just jump over here, uh, a lot of them are for certain websites. 25ACU was the cadet unit that Max was a part of. And because I was the unofficial official photographer for the cadet unit while Max was there, I would have this preset and it would export the images the way it was useful for the cadet unit. Most of these presets, I have to say, change three things. The folder that they export to, the dimensions of the exported image, and the level of JPEG compression. That's pretty much it. Uh, everything else pretty much stays the same. Stuff like um, Huggin Prepare or Hugin Prepare, they will export as TIFF files because I am going to be either doing an HDR stack or a panorama stitch. And so I don't want to be using JPEGs for that. I want to use TIFF files. And you'll notice that I've set that to 16-bit TIFF. So I'm keeping the full dynamic range of the data within the image. And so that way I can go and do whatever stitching or stacking I plan to do in Hugen, Huggen, Hugen, whatever it's called. And then once that is done, bring the exported version of that back into Darktable and if I need to do any tweaks to the overall image, I can then do that and then export to Facebook, Instagram, my photography website, whatever, right? 
so yeah, most of these things are, are all that, you know, they're just different sizes, different levels of JPEG compression. That's pretty much it. Uh, I've found that, you know, it's just so much easier to store a preset and then not have to go and manually tweak all of these settings every single time, depending on the thing that I want to export. So that's just my take. Andrew Gregg wrote to me and said, there is a lot of value in this video and the idea of tagging everyone in the shot is great. I find it interesting that given the Sony's ability to autofocus and particularly in eye detection, that you chose a manual lens for a parade in failing light. I'm not a street photographer, but I guess that the reject list is an acceptable hit. I think you did very well to only have a few soft images. On the subject of focus, I'd love to find a digital camera with the split screen focus assist from the 70s. I had a leaf shutter Fuji back then and low light focusing was a breeze. Well, as I commented back to Andrew, the reason for taking the 15 mil was because Glenn had suggested it. You know, he said, you know, take your widest angle lens, even if it is manual focus. And what Glenn said to me at the time, because we were discussing it before I'd actually gone off to do that shoot, was he said, mate, just set it at f8. He said, because at that focal length, everything's going to be in focus anyway. But of course, I completely disregarded that piece of advice and I was adjusting the aperture all through the night. Some of them, you know, I was shooting at f4 and things like that. And I think that's where I came unstuck. Um, I was happy to go and give it a go shooting a manual focus lens under those conditions where I knew I wasn't going to have a lot of time to get things right simply because the a7 III has focus peaking and I have that turned on. And what that does is it displays little red dots all over your image, uh, which shows you which part of the image is in focus. What I did come to realize though, shooting in a low light environment like that, is that when the light is too dark, the autofocus capabilities of the camera body, as opposed to the lens, because the lens is manual focus, if the AF can't detect enough contrast, then the focus peaking doesn't really work anyway, because it can't detect the contrasting areas to work out where things are in focus or out of focus. So that was something I learned from that particular night, that you know, focus peaking, as great as it is, still requires at least a certain amount of light and contrast to be helpful. Without it, you're on your own. Heyo Maria Vesconcellos Fontes de Barros, dude, you are killing me, <laughs> said to me regarding the last video, uh, 27 minutes 36, did you? I don't think you did. I've watched all your videos and can't remember. Great information anyway that I didn't have. And that was in reference to the right click and drag for the graduated filter will change the direction in which the little arrows point on the, on the graduated filter line. Um, and the direction in which they point helps you to understand which side of the line the graduated density will be applied. Now, I thought I had covered that in a previous video, but now I'm starting to think maybe he's right. Maybe I haven't. So my apologies for uh, making it sound like I'd already covered that if I haven't. Uh, that'll have to be another future episode to be covered. Alex Gerber, who I mentioned earlier in this Q&A section, also mentioned in his email, he said, to sharpen an image which is a bit out of focus, I recommend using the high pass filter with a blend mode of soft edge or soft corner. He said, I don't remember the right translation. So that's not something I've yet had a play with, but I will definitely give that a try, Alex. So thank you for the tip. He also mentioned that with the exposure module, although it defaults to only being able to drag to plus three stops, you can right click on the exposure value and enter any number up to a value of 18. And once you've done that, the exposure module will consider that far right limit to be whatever number you dialed in. So if you want 12 stops of positive exposure, you can just right click on the exposure slider, 
type in 12, hit enter, and now that right hand extremity will be 12 stops. Just for that image. For all other images, it'll still be three by default. So something to note. All right. I think that does it for another video. And you're probably thinking, what has happened to Bruce? This is three videos in three days. Well, Kath worked both Saturday and Sunday, so I was able to crank out a video yesterday and Saturday. And then today, I had the day off work because I had to go to the skin specialist. I had to get some little things burned off with liquid nitrogen, which is always a barrel of laughs, not. Uh, and so I took the whole day off, and so I thought, eh, might as well sit down and record another video. Why not? All right, that will do it. Uh, any questions or comments, please sing out in the uh, comments down below. I'll catch you in the next one.